Hi, Perpetual Chess Podcast fans. I'm Macaulay Peterson. Hope you're all having a pleasant summer. Ben is off this week, so you're stuck with me once more. My guest today is Yannick Pelletier. Yannick is a grandmaster from Switzerland. He became a grandmaster in 2001 and has won the Swiss championship six times. He's from Biel or Bien, a city in Switzerland with both a French and a German name, which is also where we spoke at the 51st Biel International Chess Festival, which was won by Shakriar Mamadyarov last month. Yannick has held a diverse range of roles in the chess world, including a commentator, a professional player, and organizer. His most recent venture, which we'll talk about, is something completely different. He's also authored a number of DVDs for Chess Base. As always, thanks for listening, and I bring you Yannick Pelletier. But we start the conversation with goats. <laughs> okay, so what are we looking at here? We are in a zoo, and we are looking at the... Um Mountain goats? How are they called? Do, I, do they have a special name? Or in yeah, mountain goats will do. Mm-hmm. With big horns. It's a nice, nice morning. Kids are having fun, I think. Remember I was here when I was a, a kid and same animals here also. I remember to see them climb up there. So. But they seem to be much more interested nowadays by food because back then we were not allowed to give them any food, even food from here oh, really? and now you can purchase that food and as we can see from other families so they are much closer to, to the fences than before <laughs> so this is the idyllic family life of a grandmaster Family life of a grandmaster, yeah. The, the thing is, you you have the two sides, yeah. You you can be at home the whole the whole time. I mean, while you're not traveling, but since I've more or less stopped, well, playing, or I just play very little tournament, and I'm very much at home. So um, yeah, it's great that I can spend so much time with family. But on the other hand, it's it's more difficult to to work efficiently. And uh, so, yeah, the two sides of them, but the family is just uh, the greatest thing. And, uh, and then we try to, uh, to arrange according to that. I mean, I'm still, I'm still in chess. Hello everyone, I'm Ben Johnson and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So, Yannick, now we're back in the... Beale Congress House in the center of Beale where the chess festival is played. Uh, we've done a little bit of intro of you at the top of the show, but can you tell a little bit about just your background, how you got into chess, where you're from? Well, since we are speaking from Beale, it's, it's probably the, the, the right place because that's where I was born in uh, 1976. And uh, yeah, I learned chess by, by chance, basically. Uh, when I was about seven, and I, I was brought to the chess club in Beale uh, quite quickly afterwards. Uh, quite, yeah, I enjoyed chess quite, quite immediately. Basically, little pieces and seemed quite, quite funny. And uh, I went to the chess club, which used to be uh, one of the most important chess clubs in Switzerland back then, uh, at the beginning of the eighties, and it lasted until two thousand and well, the years two thousand, the beginning. And then, uh, well, nowadays, unfortunately, the club still, of course, still exists, but not in the same size and the same uh, strength as before, because Biel has won the, the Swiss League team competition uh, many times when I was there, but also before that. And well, since then, unfortunately, it's uh, yeah, it's it's almost exploded. Um, yeah, and Biel is basically linked. I mean, the chess club was linked to the tradition of the festival as well. So they were, would interact and people of, from the club would also work at the festival to make it possible because the festival is 51 years old uh, this year. And, uh, of course, long history with many great tournaments, some years which were more difficult, of course. 
and um, yeah, Biel Biel is uh, is clearly the main the main city has been the main chess city in Switzerland, probably together with Zurich. To be fair, why is that? Is there uh, what is the sort of historical roots of of that uh, those two cities being the the hub of chess activity in Switzerland? Well, Zurich dates back much longer because the, the the chess club of Zurich is is more than two hundred years old. They've They've celebrated their 200th anniversary in um, 2008 and uh, with a great tournament. And they've had great tournaments as well. I mean, just mention uh, the, the candidates tournament in 53, but there are many more great events which have been played in this city. Of course, the strongest at the time, and it's still regarded as one of the strongest in, in history. Well, it was a candidate's tournament, so you can hardly do better. Uh, of course, so this, this, the history of Zurich is, is, uh, is really long, and there have been books about this by Richard Foster, among others. And, uh, well, Bill is a, is a bit, of course, younger, but still more than 50 years now of, uh, of uh, history in the chess festival. The club is, of course, a bit older, but not, not so important never really be important except when the festival went along. Um, basically, the festival of Beale it was, a, was a family story at the start. The, the Suri family, Hans Suri, the great organizer who uh, launched the, uh, the festival as, as an open first in uh, 1968. Well, it was already an international open and the second uh, edition. So, uh, for instance, Jan Thiemann, very young, Jan Thiemann as a winner, uh, I think he was just 17 or, in, or 18 when he won in 69. And uh, yeah, it's, it's developed. I mean, Hans Uri was a, a very uh, ambitious person with um, quite a lot of contacts here in, in the city uh, through his work and, um, and so on. So he managed to create a network, not just of uh, an organizing committee or team, uh, around his family, his wife and, and daughter and son also would would work at the festival to make it possible. Of course, these days, <laughs> it was a different area. Of course, no internet, everything would be done by phone and by traveling and so on. So he kept on developing the, the festival uh, uh, until basically when the first great year was 1976, Con coincidentally, the, the year I was born. Uh, the, the interzonal tournament took place here with great names as Larsen, uh, Tal, Hübner, and so on, uh, who played there. So that's that's basically the first year when Beale really appeared on the chess map as one of as a major city. Mm -hmm. And and was that also connected with the Beale Chess Club? Well, yeah, people from the club would help because of course when when you have an open with 40 or 50 participants and a few years later you have an interzonal uh with an open alongside and 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 it starts developing into a festival mm -hmm. then you need more people than just your wife and two uh, son and daughter so of course it developed and people from the club helped uh so they a team was built and uh yeah it it just went on and on and uh I think from 1977, they started staging a Grandmaster tournament, close Grandmaster tournament. Before that, it would be just an open until the, the zonal in, in 76. And then they, they had this Grandmaster tournament of, uh, you know, not the same level as now, but still a few, you know, a few big names. That was quite important at the time, just to have a few big names and then a few locals and so on. The accent was not really set on the rating average by, the, by then. But you just needed a few good names and then you had attention from the chess world and also from, from the press here in Beale. Well, eight, 1985 was the second interzonal. They had it again here in Beale. And then 1993, the very last interzonal tournament, uh, in history, uh, with just a big open here in, in on the stage up there, in the Congress Center, the uh, same venue where we are. Now, yes, now. yeah, which was a bit tiny for seventy almost participants, just a small, quite a small stage. So players were not all very happy because they were playing elbow against elbow with <laughs> other players, so it was not so easy. Anyway, the, the you know Hans Suri decided to retire after thirty years in nineteen ninety seven. And with him, major sponsors also went, like the Credit Suisse, the bank, and then it became a struggle for the new organizing committee, the new crew. But they still managed to keep it going in different sizes, 
at the start not very strong grandmaster tournament but it developed again into one of the super cities or the major uh, destinations for uh, top grandmasters and also others i mean you know it's a festival nowadays really that's what we can say we have a dozen tur- tournaments or events it's not just one grandmaster tournament it's uh, i mean not that it's easy to organize in itself uh, just a gm tournament but a festival you need a real really big uh, team yeah how helpers. big is the team nowadays well you have let's say the core of the organizing committee is four or five people who work um maybe not all year long because just after the festival we have a, a break of a few months but then it starts again in october november so four or five people working really a lot and then many people joining during the 10 days or two weeks of the festival um plus a few other people working a bit less perhaps but also sometimes in the year more more punctually so it yeah in in total now now here in the in the congress center during the festival you you have uh, perhaps around 20 people mm-hmm. working for uh, the bill just festival beat commentators you also macaulay for uh, transmission and broadcast and so yeah it's it's about 20 people that's quite a big team that's what it takes yeah indeed yeah and it it takes organization it takes uh structure and of course the more people you have the more uh, small problems may appear and then of course we need to in- connect each other and help each other if someone uh, doesn't manage to do something then of course someone else is there to help and um, of course always some tensions sometimes this is also not unavoidable basically uh, the the bigger the team the the more p- likely you'll have some tensions but uh all in all we we are doing uh well i think but swiss are known as generally being good at working out uh compromises yeah. working out tensions yeah, so in general we we do okay indeed yeah <laughs> well uh, speaking of of um the country and and maybe you can just kind of explain a bit about the positioning of beal uh on this border of the french and german parts of switzerland because i think this is an interesting uh, detail for uh, well especially for americans but for for uh, anyone uh, in countries where there is not this uh, uh, very stark contrast of mm-hmm. of uh, languages and cultures that somehow have all managed to fit together in a confederation it's a, it's an unusual story and you're also uh, a, the product of that in in terms mm-hmm. of your being fluent in in french and german and and of course english and and i don't know other languages yes, spanish yeah <laughs> spanish and russian too yeah and yeah well yeah Biel is officially the only uh Swiss city which is bilingual uh French and and German or Swiss German if you want uh there are other cities where both uh languages are spoken but in more the contrast is is bigger in Swiss in, in Biel it's more like 60% German 30 maybe a bit less than 30 French and the rest a bit mixed uh so um yeah it's um, but basically Switzerland lives this uh, language problems. We could we could call it problems in general, extremely well, and they cope really well. I mean, Swiss people with that. I mean, in many countries in the world, there will already be wars and everything and and splitting. I mean, it, I mean, language is probably the second most difficult. I mean, after religion, uh, the second uh, biggest hurdle to to over, over, overcome as a, as a country as a as a community because you need communication i mean religion has problems for for many other reasons of course communication as well but but communication is paramount if you want to live together well and uh, the fact that of course people learn both languages i mean in theory at least uh, at school uh, so they we can un- understand each other not that we can all speak i mean i'm i'm a french french speaker that's my mother tongue and i learned from your parents um yeah. yeah from my parents both of them french speaker uh, my my father is french from france and mm-hmm. my mother is from switzerland uh, but french speaker but i learned german quite quickly at the, at the chess club by the way and of course at school it helped i mean connection between the chess club the fact that i learned basically the rules of of german at school and i could practice it at the chess club 
I was uh, a big help, of course. And, uh, but it's not the case for everybody. I mean, many people don't really speak well. I mean, French speakers don't really speak well German, not all of them. I mean, that's, it's a myth to, to, to believe that Swiss people all speak like three, four languages fluently. Uh, well, but then true. in school, do, do all of the, the uh, sort of predominantly French speakers start learning German and then, and then vice versa? From, and from what age? There are French-speaking schools and German-speaking schools. I see. That's especially in Beal the case, like maybe not 50-50, but maybe, yeah, 60-40 percent. So you would tend uh, so to go basically to the French-speaking school exactly. when you start out I in mean, all first the, grade. All my classes were done in French, except, of course, when the English class, of course, then we, we learned English, and the German class, we, 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 were, we learned uh, German. Mm -hmm. But there was not, no mixed... I mean, nowadays it exists. You can have classrooms where... Um, classes are given mixed. I mean, one class in German, the next class in, in French. But it's it's quite recent. Mm -hmm. In my times, uh, there they were only just these French schools, French German schools, and that's where you learn languages. And indeed, uh, I mean, when you're a kid, uh, you spend time with. Uh, if you're a French-speaking kid, you're going to spend time with French-speaking kids, and for German the same. So still, you can you can. Mix up a little bit, but it's not like you can easily learn the language, the other language. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in that sense, we, I think we are doing really well. That uh, Switzerland is still very, I mean, is very stable as a country. Of course, the economic situation helps a lot. It's very stable. Switzerland is a rich country, and there is no, I mean, no real problems for people. I mean, social, social anyways. So. Um, Yeah, we, but we are doing well. So that's what we, you were saying, but basically that Swiss people know how to, to cope with tensions and uh, remain, try to remain neutral and, and try to solve problems. Well, and, and this may very well be uh, connected in, in I when you start so, yeah. to learn this from a very young age, how, mm. how to just play in the playground with yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Swiss German speaking kids. That's true, yeah. But... Um, but okay, so you, you start, you're in a French school, you start learning German at the age of... Around 10 around 10. And then uh, a couple of years later, you start learning English as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, two or three years later. I yeah. Think. And pretty much everybody <clears throat> has this experience. So you have, mm -hmm. uh, by the time you're, uh, let's say, thinking about university or whatever, you're pretty much everyone is going to be trilingual. Yeah, 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 yeah. It seems to me that at least that the English proficiency of Swiss people is very high. I mean, on par with maybe... Um, actually, I, I, I should say that... Uh, That's probably a bit less so in the in the the really French areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I, I concur. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, that's true. Because the, the really French areas, they they tend to, to to speak much more French, and 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 there are certainly uh, French Swiss people that I know who don't even speak Swiss Swiss German very much. Yeah, well, that, but that's a problem because um, you see, when you you're a German speaker, let's say in in Basel or Zurich, and you learn French at school, the language you learn is the one spoken in France in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. When you learn German uh, at a school in Geneva, what you learn is, is German from Germany, the Hochdeutsch. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what, what you hear when you go to Zurich is the Swiss German, which is really different. It's difficult. I mean, it's more frust frustrating for, for people from Geneva or Lausanne who were French speakers. They, they learn this language. They go to, to, to Zurich and they want to speak it and others they look at them and they just answer in, in Swiss German and, and yeah good luck <laughs> so uh, it's it can be frustrating and and in that sense uh, people from Zurich for instance they are a bit more open to uh, to French speakers and they will try to speak French because they, they are aware of this gap between Swiss German and German mm -hmm. so they, they are aware that uh, French speakers may struggle with the language they've learned and the one they have to speak in, in their, their own country. Uh, it's true that, I mean, Swiss German remains kind of a dialect. I mean, you can still write things, of course, but it's basically not written. So you don't learn it at school. Is there, is there, is there kind of a, I don't know, a, a, a typical sentence that, that well illustrates the difference between high German and Swiss German for people who aren't familiar with the dialect differences? Well, many. Well, most of the words are, are distorted or transformed. Mm -hmm. uh, guten Tag in Hochdeutsch German will be Gute Tag, and this is not a big difference yet. Uh, mm, but it's clearly a difference. Yeah. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen, so goodbye. Wiederluege, 
for instance. That's already a bit more. It's like a different word. It's yeah. it's almost a different word because Zayn is changing completely the world. Yeah. So sometimes, yeah, it can be frustrating, and that's that's. But still, I mean, okay, we we cope with that, and uh, and, and uh, I repeat that the the financial, very stable financial s- situation of Switzerland helps. Yeah. The economics economical situation is is very stable, so people don't have reasons to to hate each other basically they 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 are sat- well you know they're satisfied with their life already so there is no need to create fights yeah can you say just something a bit longer like uh you know uh, i'd like to go to the playing hall to get an autograph from magnus carlson in swiss german and in both just so we can uh, hear the some something a bit longer of a difference uh so in in hochdeutsch so yeah. in the german from germany it's going to be uh Ich möchte jetzt zum Spielsaal gehen und eine ein Autogramm von Magnus Carlsen zu bekommen. And in Swiss German it's going to be like uh, jetzt möchte ich gerne zum Spielsaal gehen und ein Autogramm von Magnus Carlsen bekommen. Mm-hmm. So okay, yeah. you you know if you have an ex- exercise ear you might you know follow but I mean especially if you speak German or one of the two languages you 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 might follow but, but we could say it's, it's it's sort of on par between let's say uh London British English and you know uh, Arkansas Southern American English. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> All right, so then in terms of the the Swiss chess scene or the Swiss chess culture, um, how does it compare to, let's say, neighbors in, in Germany and, and France? Is well, we are weaker chess players. Yeah. <laughs> That's but quite you're clear. also we a smaller are, country, course, but we, I mean... We are a small, smaller country, of course. But let I think the, the best to compare, the, the best, um, you know, to compare the dynamic, is the best is comparing with Italy. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I remember we played against Italy in the Olympiads in, in 2000, and we were clear favorite. I mean, we had Kolschner in board one and then a few GMs. I mean, not, not a few GMs, we had Gallagher. Okay, I was just, just not a GM yet, but we, we, we beat Italy quite normally. I mean, we didn't crush them, but it was just a normal match and we won normally and uh, nobody was shocked <laughs> in Italy or Switzerland. It was just normal. And, uh, and the development of, of Italy in the past few years I'm not speaking of Fabiano Caruana, who's been in Italy for a while, but but the rest, I mean, they're just young young players who've learned chess, perhaps at school or wherever, and they've become really strong. Vocaturo, Brunello, you name it. Yeah, you have like five, six uh, very young GMs now who who are very strong and can be can become even stronger. And we don't we don't have this tendency in Switzerland. We have, okay, we have Nico Georgiadis, we have Noel Studer, but they are all in the range of about 2,500, maybe 2,530, while these Italians, they are already 2,600. So that and they're, some of them they're are on the level where they're going to continue to play chess professionally, whereas the Swiss uh, top GMs are, are more amateurs. It's, it's, yeah, the process starts even before. At a younger age, I think that... Yeah, what is that? Did the kids... The, is classic chess uh, also big, but then people drop out, or how does it work? It's very difficult to explain, I mean, the reasons, because uh, it's been a tendency in the whole world, almost, that chess players become strong at a younger age, and they start learning chess, thanks to computers, internet, and so on. In Switzerland, this tendency doesn't seem to exist. I, I, I always tend to joke that in Switzerland, inflation is very low, and that, that counts also for, for, for rating, <laughs> unfortunately, because there is an inflation in rating as well, if you compare it with uh, 20 years ago. But Switzerland doesn't seem to be <laughs> affected by, by this, unfortunately. Uh, the, <laughs> the rating is pegged to the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the inflation rate. And um, I don't really know why. What, what, one of the reasons is that making a living in Switzerland as, as an independent, so a chess player, for instance, is very difficult. I mean, its uh, salaries are extremely high. The cost of life is, is very high and so on. So, of course, if, if you have a normal job, you will get a, a normal salary according to, to the cost of life in Switzerland, very high. Um, even if uh, you have a, a very normal and easy job, I mean easy in the sense of a very basic jo- job, you'll, you'll get the minimal and, and that's already high enough. As a chess player, you need to struggle. Mm-hmm. You go and play a match in the Bundesliga, you, you get the same fee 
as that GM from the Ukraine, except that this GM from the Ukraine can live a month with that fee and you can live two days. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not the same. So, of course, the, this situation, the you know, this very high cost of life in Switzerland makes it very difficult for chess players to live from their passion. Yeah. And uh, and it affects also young players. They say, okay, chess is nice, I'm going to play a bit, but I'm never going to invest any time or too much time in it. I like it, so I'm going to do it. I have some free time, but that's it. I have to study, I have to finish my university. And and then, okay, then it's already too late to become a very strong <laughs> chess player. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, we certainly have the same problem in the US that uh, you could call it a, an opportunities problem that mm. uh, people, even if they're, they are very talented and they do start young, at some level, there are the things that, uh, that just simply seem to be more rewarding. And those who do play chess professionally are, you know, invariably also teaching or doing commentary or doing other mm -hmm. things besides playing, mm -hmm. um, which in some cases can also take away from their time that they could otherwise use to develop sure. their own chess. Of course, yeah. So how did you, uh, I mean, how did you handle this this problem uh, yourself? I mean, you, you have become a chess professional, mm -hmm. although doing a variety of things, but uh, at some moment, um, you know, when you were doing your studies and you had to say, well, okay, this is something I want to continue with. Well, I completed my um, high school here in Biel, at the gymnase, uh, so that was at age 20. At the time, that was normal. You finished, we'd finished between 19 and 20, so it's already pretty late before going to university at 20 or 21. And um, so I, I finished that, completed my high school degree, and then I decided to try and be a chess professional. I was a good IM at the time, and I, I became a GM within a few years. And I had given myself two years to try it, and I, I liked it, and I, I did... Um, yeah, I did develop well as, as a chess player in these two years. And then I had a, yeah, I had this setback a little bit for one or two year, more years when I did not progress. And then, then I exploded. Well, I just, I got the GM title and I, I raised to 26 something rating, uh, for my peak rating in 2003. Um, well, at the time I, I was just a chess player, nothing else. I wouldn't give lessons or very, very rarely or just. Uh, sometimes just make a few analysis for for magazines, but just normal normal stuff. But I was just a full time chess professional, um, and I lived in Switzerland until 2007 in Biel. And then I moved to France for not for economical reasons. Uh, I moved to France to the south Montpellier, and um, of course there, you know, the difference in terms of cost of life was was huge. So. Uh, from from being a normal, you know, with a normal salary or not salary, but income as a chess player in Switzerland, I was doing okay. I became quite rich <laughs> in <laughs> France, so it uh, <laughs> it was quite interesting, yeah. And um, yeah, so now I, I live with my family in in Luxembourg, where my wife is from, and yeah, that's that's already uh, you know the Luxembourg is already much a bit more expensive than than. Than France, but not as much as Switzerland. So, so Swiss professional <laughs> chess players can be uh, expats and and live and yeah. have okay too. That's this one solution, but but yeah, but not there, ideal. there is this this um, this misunderstanding. So even some some chess players in Switzerland have this mi misunderstanding that they believe that I I quit uh, or I left Switzerland so that I could still be a chess professional, and that's not the case. That's mm -hmm. not the reason. All right. Well, maybe this would be a good segue to uh, to talk a little bit about. Family, because this is this is another kind of major challenge, I would say, for the typically nomadic lifestyle of of uh, chess professionals: when to settle down, if to settle down, um, and how to manage uh, <laughs> that when your uh, when your demands of your schedule call, call for being on the road a lot. You mentioned your your wife is in uh, is, his family is in Luxembourg. You were living in in uh, Paris for a while. Mm -hmm. While she was completing her studies, yeah. Which was where your your first child was born? He was born in Montpellier still. Montpellier. He was okay. still born in Montpellier, but then we quickly moved to Paris a few months after his birth. And uh, that's where she, she did the photography school in, in Paris to complete that uh, master degree. And uh, when the second came, the second boy came, we uh, we moved to, to Luxembourg back where she, she was from uh, for several reasons 
uh, yeah, the main reason being that we <laughs> didn't want our child to, to be born in Paris. I mean, it was just too complicated for many reasons. And uh, that's why we, we went to, to Luxembourg where, yeah, it's, life is more quiet, but also pretty well organized and everything. I suppose at that point in your career, you were, you were already past your peak of playing activity. You'd much mm -hmm. more already moved into the uh, organizing area of things. But still, I mean, was that, um, you still do play, you still play, you play, just played in the Swiss championship. How did you uh, kind of approach the decision to, to start a family? Uh, I mean, how much of your, is that, uh, of your, the limitations on your time as a, as a chess professional come into play? Is it different than other careers, do you think? Well, the fir first starting point, of course, is to find the right person to start a family with. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> the time is, uh, I mean, for us men, it's, uh, the time is more, you know, we are, less limited in time. So I, I indeed, um, I, I, I was pr pretty old when I had my first uh, child, I mean, relatively speaking. And um, well, actually, having a family, have, having kids is, is the nicest thing, which, uh, which I, I can have. I mean, I, I enjoyed living alone before when I was a chess player. But it's clear that in the long run, it's not what I was, you know, planning for my life so it would be good for a while or as long as as, uh, as I don't find anyone for instance and so on but then then it was all just natural it just became very naturally and of course then you yeah it requires organization and of course um, decisions important decisions in in our life family life and um, of course chess I mean chess wise as you said my peak was was already behind because I reached my peak rating in 2003 I remain around 2600 top top 100 in the world for uh, one for two three years maybe. Uh, I was still around 2600 for about a decade, even though uh, inflation again, yeah, the top 100 moved up yeah, in the rating. And uh, s but of course, yeah, it's it's clear I would never be a top 10 player or something like this. So uh, so it was it was indeed time to to start thinking about. Not just playing, but doing other, uh, other things like coaching. Like uh, you know, n you know, it's become very popular to be a commentator uh, during events. And even some people who have, let's say, no real chess background can make commentary nowadays. Um, so yeah, with with all the live broadcast and uh, internet, YouTube, and so on, it's it's very easy to to have. Uh, or to make commentary, and so I, I became a commentator as well in in several events. Uh, I also stepped in here, as you said, in the organizing committee of uh, of Peel since two thousand and well twelve thirteen, uh, following the um, tragic death of uh, one of the organizers. Before I took his um, his post, um, so to combine with a family life, yeah, it, it actually. It's a process which is it's more is more or less natural also to going together with with a time nowadays how ch time change uh, and um, it's true that I can do many more things uh, chess related from home which is very good when you have kids but also challenging in a way and that's perhaps something we'll talk a bit about uh, about it uh, later. Um, but of course, I play less, as you said. I, I still play a few tournaments per year. I mean, what I call the major tournaments, from my point of view, like Swiss Championship, Olympiad with uh, the Swiss team, and a few, a few things. But it's uh, it's basically um, it has to be interesting, challenging from the chess point of view. It also has to be financially rewarding. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. I you know I can't afford to 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 tell to myself and my family. Now I'm going to play this open and let's see if I win and I'll, I'll bring back some money home. No, that's, that's not possible anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so time has to be, you know, has to be well uh, used. And um, that's, that's how it is. And that's, that's actually very normal because the time I, I, I have, I want also to spend a lot with my family. And in a way, um, you were you were sp you were mentioning the word you were saying the word challenge. Yeah, it's it's quite challenging indeed. And that's not just for chess players, for for independent people who work at home or from home. Um, to combine work and family life is is demanding because you you might have kids around all all, all the time on at some on some days at least, and you still have to work. You can't. You can't just say, oh, now I'm going to my office 
from eight to, to six. And I'll be back later for dinner. Unless, of so, course, you're in Hamburg and coming to record a couple of DVDs for, for chess bass. Yeah. It's okay. kind of like a holiday. <laughs> yeah. Well, not holiday, of course. That's work. Yeah, that's uh, that's not holiday. Uh, it's uh, it's always... I mean, of course, I, 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 I do it very you know very well and i try to to be as professional as possible but still when i when i'm away from the family i mean i'm missing missing my kids my wife so it's it's obviously uh, always this this twofold sides you know, like you have this of course you have to work you have to do it and um, you, you do it as 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 well as possible but then you're happy to go home <laughs> and then see your your family and yeah, and it's also for my wife uh, because she she's also independent as a as a worker. So we need to combine our time table or our schedule, uh, working schedule, together with kids. And and sometimes you know it's yeah it's 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 a challenge. Yeah? It's not easy uh, to organize everything. Well, and speaking of your wife Marie, lately you have a new project that's completely separate from chess, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I was so surprised when you first mentioned it to me because I, I've only mainly communicated with you about chess subjects that I, I was concerned at first that your social media account had been taken over <laughs> when you told me this. But tell, tell about uh, what is this new venture? Yes. Yeah, so, so, OK, it's a, it's a project that Marie had, uh, had had already for quite a while together with a fellow photographer. Yeah. But since then, she's she's going her way with this. And I'm I'm helping as as much as I can as as well as I can. It's going to be a magazine, uh, written magazine, paper magazine, not not something online. Although there there is of course a, a website and uh, things will be uh, shown online as well. But it's going to be a, a magazine called You Know Me. That's a Japanese um, term. Um, describing, I mean, You Know Me in, in Japanese means uh, these these little cups, teacups which usually go by pair and handmade cups where you can drink. And we have an, another long-term project linked to this, but that's that's perhaps for another, another time. But for, for the time being, it's this magazine, which is going to be about art, lifestyle. And the th- one of the main things about this magazine and also the importance of, of having it physically done I mean, in paper, is that Marie is a photographer in analog photography, uh, film photography. So the old uh, techniques, not um, not the digital, uh, which because nowadays anyone can call himself a photographer with a cell phone. The quality is pretty good, and you can easily do, do good pictures with uh, take good pictures with with your phone. But uh, yeah, it's doesn't still mean that you're a good photographer and and you never set foot in a dark room <laughs> so the dark room is uh, of course important and, and all pictures which are going to be displayed or shown in, published in the in the magazine will be will be film photography which uh to those who don't know it uh and it's easy not to know it i mean the, the quality of of the picture especially in black and white photography can be much better uh in film photography than in, in uh, digital. So there is still uh, a gap. And this is even more amazing that some of these old cameras were, were built in, in the 60s, 70s, and they still managed to produce better quality than, than, uh, than the, the best digital uh, cameras nowadays. Mm-hmm. So is there, is there a sort of a, a component of this, of trying to, to preserve or rescue an, an otherwise fading art? Sure, that's that's something important to her, and um, and she's also, I mean, the first magazine is going to come out in October this year, and um, there are some uh, people who work together. Uh, for of course, she's not alone doing it. Of course, that's uh, that's a huge project, and so she has some uh, some people working for, her, and she's making some some articles about also what, for instance, one a photographer of film photography who, who is a Swiss photographer. He's already pretty old, already around 70. That's uh, Christian Coignier. And um, yeah, she, she's making points of also having people who who are very important to to, to the photography. And um, and there is going to be a co-worker as well, of, uh, an architect from, from Paris. I mean, he's originally from, from Iran, but has an office in Paris, New York, and London. So he's uh, famous as well. So there are going to be articles about all going around art, architecture. There is going to be lifestyle. 
uh, chess players may be interested to purchase it because there is going to be something about Magnus Carlsen as well in it. You know, it's Magnus Carlsen uh, as the chess player, the, the artist chess player, let's say. And uh, In this so first issue in October? In the first issue, yeah. Right. Okay, interesting. We'll look for that. Mm-hmm. Is there uh, any other chess connection? Will there be, uh, I mean, you know, chess has this art component. Maybe there's a chess column. I don't know. Um, I know that's not planned. <laughs> I have to disappoint <laughs> you, but that's not going to be chess related, except perhaps for one or two figures. I mean, mm-hmm. big, big personalities in, in chess. World. But it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's mostly art related. Um, yeah architecture and of course all turning around photography there might be also travel you know destinations um reports on on some travel destinations which could be in- interesting also yeah. linked perhaps to interior designing and so on so so a little bit in the sort of monocle vein Mo- monocle monocle is this british magazine that's uh, also about art and design and yeah, yeah. I mean, there are other. I mean, it's not. It's there are other uh, magazines which uh, which are uh, similar mm-hmm. in in the idea. But I'm not sure they all do in uh, in film photography. So that's that's certainly the uh, the uh, what's standing out. And it's going to be published in English. It's yeah, exactly in English. Yeah, that's good mm-hmm. to to mention as well. English. Yeah. And what's your involvement then? Yeah, practically. Well, I, I try to help. I mean, uh, as much as possible. Uh, of course, the um, the financing is not an easy thing as well. So there is a, a fundraising also going on soon, starting soon, and uh, so we have to to back this project uh, from all points of view. And I, I try to coordinate some some um, meeting of Marie, some photo shooting of Marie with uh, some of the contributors, uh, some of the um, artists uh, shown in the in the magazine. Uh, so that's, yeah, I mean, she has a huge amount of work and I, I try to help a little bit as much as I can, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's her project and, and it's, it's then, of course, it's, it affects the family. So it's a family thing. So I have to, to help as much as uh, I can. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the festival, which uh, when we're recording this is still ongoing, but when we publish it, it will have wrapped up. Well, this year, since we mentioned Magnus Carlsen in the magazine, is also noticeable because it's his first time back since 2012, mm-hmm. which I think was incidentally the last time that I was here in Beale. Should come next year then. And yep. Maybe you'll bring him along again. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the cause and effect might have been the other way around. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, the uh, uh, he uh, this is actually one of the tournaments that he... Um, started playing in from a young age. I believe it was on his first European tour when he was still... Uh, yeah, 2005 it was. And he yeah he said it was the first big tournament he played, uh, yeah. GM tournament he played. He might have played something in, in Norway before, but uh, outside Norway it was the first uh, international GM event he would play. So he had a, a real kind of um, affinity for the... The festival and and uh, and the site and and uh yeah it's true and he came back in 2006 he came back in 2007 and that was actually the first very big tournament he won uh in Beale in 2007 so the first he played in in 05 then 07 he won and then he played again in, in 2008 and 11 and 12 right and he won it twice 2007 and 11 and when was the famous game when you uh, beat him? And- um, well, I, I beat him three times. Uh, I beat him in his first appearance here in 2005, in actually in 15 moves when he he overlooked something and lost a piece uh, f- after the opening. I beat him in 2007 when he won the event. He, I think he, st- he had started with five or five and a half of six. And then he lost to me and to Van Veli. And he had to win the last round against Rajabov to win the event. I mean, to tie for the win and then he he won it against Rajabov and he won the tie break against Sonny Shuk in 2000. So but of course he beat me <laughs> also I'm, I'm, I just spoke about the two victories there in Beale but he beat me more of, more often of course. And and the one you probably mentioned is the European t- team championship uh-huh. in 2015 in Reykjavik. Event. Yeah. Well that was the the only time we played each, against each other with a Carlsen as a world champion and I was lucky enough to win it yeah. So 2015, but uh, not responsible for his absence from Beale Chess Festival. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Actually, after the game, he was uh, he was definitely friendly. I mean, even though he the game was he was white and he was pushing a bit. I was a bit low on time. He had his typical end game grip, and I managed to defend well. 
uh, after time trouble as well, and suddenly he he overlooked something and he lost a piece in the end game. <laughs> that's pretty, pretty, uh, yeah, it's pretty lethal <laughs> normally. And so, well, I won that game, and he reacted quite coolly after the game. We talked a little bit, and the in the evening that was before the free day on the European Team Championship, and and uh, yeah, in the evening we were in the hotel. I saw him, and we. We chatted as well, and he said, "Yeah, coming to Beal would be a good thing. One, one, if we can combine things and see if the schedule is is okay." And, but of course, um, I mean, his his uh, coming this year to Beal was all done through his manager. I mean, I, I was not in contact with him, it's, and that's that's the way it should be. I mean, that's the way he wants it to be. So nothing special. And um, yeah, as far as the uh, the future of of Beal, your what is your what is your actual role? Tournament director. Yeah, Grandmaster Tournament Director, and also also coordinate uh, invitations for the Master Open. And you essentially started that in the year following uh, Olivier's death? Exactly, yeah. Uh, Olivier Breisacher passed away in 2012, just after, a few weeks after the festival. Yeah, I remember that. And then um, I, I, yeah, I suggested that I, I might help to, you know, contact the GMs and so on for the event, for the close event and and so on and well actually I took my my proposal quite seriously <laughs> since they they actually I, I I offered my hand and they just pulled the whole arm and the whole body came with it and, <laughs> and now I'm fully in, in the involved yeah so do we know yet now there'll be a 52nd edition well hopefully uh, I mean the problem with the Beale festival is that it's it's a uh, a yearly struggle. It's every year a struggle to to ensure the financing from the city, because the f- the city, you know, the the budget of of the Bill Festival is composed by about a third third, maybe a bit more than the third party comes from the city. So if we don't have this support, then it's uh, unlikely we we can do anything special. And the problem is they they have to vote about it every year. Like they have to vote bo- vote on their uh, yearly budget every year around autumn uh, yeah maybe in november or something so that's that's all we only know about in october or november if if we're going to be able to stage the festival next year so you can see it's 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 not stability is not (laughs) the word we can use there but uh so far it's been it's been working well i mean the city even though it was pretty close sometimes they they keep on supporting uh, the event. You have it's a lot all, of good lobbyists in the community. Well, we have a very important person in in the organizing committee who is Peter Bornblust. He he used to be he's now retired. But he used to be a prosecutor of of the city, and he's uh, he has a lot of relationship in uh, you know politics and so on. So he he's definitely someone very important behind the scenes to try and ensure. Uh, the perennity of uh, of the fundings from from the city, but still, I mean. <laughs> even he with his power or his network he he says that uh, it does not just depend on him and and uh, it's it's a constant struggle so now he's been trying to ensure a four year contract with the with the city but uh, he's he's not very optimistic on this but at least it it you know it, by doing this he shows the city that the the, the festival is something which has to last uh, it's, uh, we're already more than 50 years old, of course, but it has to last. It shouldn't stop. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, it's very beneficial for the city as well, for tourism, because we are now in the uh, summer period. Bill is not a holiday resort. It's not like in the Alps or something. It's, it's, it's a pleasant city in the summer with the lake and so on, but it's not the number one destination people would think of when they, when they have a holiday in Switzerland in mind. Uh, so the, the city is pretty empty uh, in the summer period in, in the vacation. So it's nice to bring people and it's good tourist they bring marketing. People. I mean, we we've had we're gonna have more than seven hundred participants, or you know, considering all tournaments together. So that's that's more or less with families and so on coming along. It's it's more than a thousand, uh, maybe even more. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, people staying here for t- ten days, maybe two weeks. You know. Hotels, apartments, restaurants, souvenirs, and so on. I mean, it, it generates something for the mm-hmm. city as well, and and the city is certainly aware of it. And it's probably also good that you have had this stable name sponsor, Accentus, for the last several years. Well, yeah, Accentus uh, 
thanks to them we've we've been able to secure Magnus Carlsen because this year they've they've given more than than before they haven't given every year Accenters is a foundation not just for chess but many many projects in Switzerland they have this chess part as well with one important man well there are a few important people but one very important man who used to be the, the the CEO of the Credit Suisse Bank he's now retired he's almost 90 but um He's uh, extremely important behind the scenes as well, and for chess in general, ju- mm-hmm. not just in business. Mr. Wirt. Mr. Wirt, William Wirt, of course, exactly. And uh, so the Accenters has, had been given, giving money to, to the festival, I think, already in the years 2000 in, in smaller uh, amounts. But uh, this year, yeah, they've given much more, and that's, that's very good. Mm-hmm. Man- we managed to secure Magnus thanks to this. And is there also any support for the Swiss Olympiad team? Not really. Not really. No, I mean it's coming from the federation. They okay. Have a, they have a decent budget and they're doing a good job. I mean, in general, I mean you can always find things where they could do better and 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 so on. But I think the Swiss federation is generally doing a good job. How is Switzerland fixed for Batumi? Yeah, the team has been selected uh, following the, the Swiss championship. I mean that was just for a spot number five because four people were quite clear. And the man, uh, yeah, Sebastian Bogner is now number one. He's around 2600, maybe slightly over. And he won the championship. I mean, just crushed the field, include, me included. Um, so I'm going to be number two. Nico Georgiadis is number three. I mean, the board order can, can be decided later, but according to rating at least. Uh, Noel Studer is going to be number four. And they've selected uh, Florian Yeni as number five. He's played well in the, in the Swiss championship, finish, finishing third. And... Um, yeah, he's making a comeback. I mean, he had quit chess for some years, starting from 2009 or something. So he, he's made this comeback. I mean, he's not as strong as before, but he's still, you know, he has this good understanding in general. So he's going to be number five. And okay, we have a decent team, but not to <laughs> not to tackle uh, strongest, uh, the strongest teams in, in the Olympiad, of course. But you've all played together before? Yeah, we've played uh, almost the same. I mean, we have this this now quite young team. I mean, ten years ago, the team would be uh, would be Korchnoi, Gallagher, Ekstrom, me, Yeni, maybe also so an old older team, of course. Yeah, now now that Victor has passed away and and Joe Gallagher has lost rating points, they're not in the team anymore. So yeah, we have a younger team. Yeah, Sebastian is uh, is twenty six or seven, and Georgiadis stood at twenty two. Okay, Florian is a bit older like me <laughs> but uh, uh, he's not as old as me but he's uh, still in the older generation so you're so actually the, the, the senior <coughs> yeah, veteran the senior. member yeah exactly yeah <laughs> I'm the deacon <laughs> had to happen at some point all right well great um, one one regular feature of the podcast is uh, one or two book recommendations things that helped you as a chess player or things that you uh, recommend uh, other people see uh, in particular well, so I'll try to be original because we can always mention the, the books everyone knows. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to suggest uh, maybe Endgame Virtuoso by Smyslov. I mean, I have it in Russian. It's a, it's a booklet, uh, but it's he has like um, yeah many Endgames of his explained. It's not much about variations because with Smyslov variations were not all always too relevant, but the explanations are very useful on how to, why he played the end game like this, why he chose this, why, what you should do with this material configuration and so on. It's a really, really nice book for, for end games. I liked, um, okay, Dvoretsky books, but that's, that's very demanding. I mean, you, you, it requires already a basic level of, of, of a strong amateur to, to really uh, benefit from these books, but they are also great. But then, if if you want to reach the level, then you can start with the Yusupov uh, series, because he's started this this tiger. Uh, I don't know how you call them in in in, in English. In, in German, it's Tigersprung, yeah? tiger jump. Yeah? So, for for beginners, uh, a whole series for beginners, a whole series for after that, and 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 uh, I think it's really really useful. Mm-hmm. I saw Arthur Yusupov was yeah. here playing. In, is he playing in the Open or just he has played students? in the Blitz? He, he came to he came to watch the uh, the games of the GM tournament on on Friday. Then he played in the Blitz. Yes, uh, yesterday on Saturday, he's probably going to be around today to watch it as well, and, and probably go go back. He's he's been he's been a trainer of of Georgiadis, so he certainly comes. 
to watch a bit and talk maybe a bit, you know, try to cheer him up maybe. <laughs> he's very, he's a very positive person. I mean, in, in terms of uh, cheering up and always, always very, you know. Encouraging. Yeah, encouraging and giving good advice. I mean, he's so experienced as well that he can give not just uh, cheer, cheerful en encouragements, but also some nice advice, piece of, pieces of advice. Is there anything else, um, yeah, any other topics that uh, that come to mind that would be interesting for our listeners to know about that I haven't mentioned? Just a few, you know, again, self-publicity. Yeah, definitely tell tell us how to find you online. I have this YouTube channel. I've started it in at the beginning of the year with a weekly live stream when I'm not away. Weekly live stream on Thursday uh, night, I mean, in European time. You can find me on YouTube, I mean, by just clicking, uh, I mean, or typing Yannick Peltier and chess and uh, you're gonna end up on my channel eventually even though i don't have too many followers but because unfortunately besides the live stream i also have videos but i i, I have yeah I, it's not easy to publish you know if you want your channel to be really successful you need to publish on a daily basis uh, and better two videos per day than one <laughs> if possible i mean so uh, yeah that's i can't do this i mean i, I would have to record this a lot while kids are around and it's not really possible. So the live stream takes place in the evening on Thursday. So well, kids are asleep, so that's all right. But for the videos, it's, it's a bit more complicated. So I couldn't publish as many as I would like, but still, I think the content is pretty interesting. And uh, I mean, certainly something people might want to discover. So I just invite you <laughs> to like and subscribe to my channel in, on YouTube. Yeah. And well, otherwise, yeah, on social media. On, on you have Facebook. a personal website? Uh, no, not no. yet. I, I'm, I'm quite active on my Facebook page and Instagram sometimes as well. Twitter, well, from time to time, yeah. I'm trying my best. I know it's very important. I, I'm still, it's not that I'm lazy, but I just sometimes just forget because I have too, too many things to do, yeah. And how about the new magazine? Any place to look for that yet or still in the Yeah, the you know me, you know me you know me dot uh, magazine yeah okay we'll put all well, those you can, links uh, you can just put you know me magazine in in on google and you'll yeah. find you'll well find we'll put all those links in the show notes for the that's, podcast that's, as well so i'm very grateful <laughs> that'll be uh yeah and you know me easy is way also, to find you. also on facebook and with uh with daily news or daily you know uh, posts okay great well thank you very much for uh coming on perpetual chess yeah, and thank you. good luck thank you Thanks for listening to Perpetual Chess. If you like the show, shout it from the hilltops. Tell your friends. Write positive reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform. If you don't like the show, just keep it to yourself. I want to give special thanks to Geert Vandervelt for making the intro music. And of course, I have to thank my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual partners, without whom the show would not be possible. They are Adam Ralph, Adam Vrancourge, Adrian Gutierrez, Andres Krizdwa, Alex Pejas, Brian Mullis, Carl Labans, Chris Wainscott, Chad Hilton, Christopher Wood, Coach J's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, I am Christoph Zalicki, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, I am Alec Donnie Ariel, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jacob Agar, James Bonastia, Jennifer Valens, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Hartman, John Jernigan, Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, WGM Katarina Nemkova, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopalakrishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passy, the producer of Perpetual Chess, Macaulay Peterson, Matthew Tedesco, Nathan Webster, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randall Temple, Ricky Grahava, Rob Lazorchek, Robert Steiner, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Victor Vrankouj, FM Zhao Cheng, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks again, everyone. I will be back soon with another interview. Oh, you are, Yannick. You are, Yannick. <laughs> I'm not laughing with you, I'm laughing at you. <laughs> huh?